And thank you so much for staying with Morning Live. Uh, Zimbabwean President Emerson Mnangagwa has pleaded for time and patience to bring the economy back from the dead. Now, in his State of the Nation address in Parliament last week, Mnangagwa acknowledged uh, the economic crisis faced by Zimbabwe as well as the need for reform. The country's economy has been under immense pressure with people grappling with rising prices and shortages of fuel and electricity, to name but a few. Now, political analyst Jamie Mighty joins us now to discuss this persistent challenge uh, faced by the Zimbabwean government. Thanks so much for your time. And good to see you again. Pleasure to be here. So let's start at the beginning. This is by no means a new phenomenon in um, in Zimbabwe. They have been grappling with this economic crisis and trying to get this economy back on track uh, for a few decades now, if we are being honest. So the president acknowledging this last week, does that bring any sort of relief? Does this make things better? No, it doesn't make things better. And in fact, the whole give me more time, I'm going to fix it type of thing calls into question that Einstein quotation, right? That if you keep repeating the same thing, expecting different results, then what are you, right? Um, one of the criticisms that was raised when the coup happened was this was not going to be a change in anything substantial on the ground. And many people, you know, were called, uh, I was one of those people, people say that we were throwing water on the parade, so to speak, rain on the parade. But the reality is Emerson Nangagwa's economic school of thought is a Robert Mugabe economic school of thought. And there's a lack of ideas, there's a lack of creativity, also a lack of understanding about how media works, how you tell your investment story in 2019 is totally different to how you would tell your investment story in 1982 or 1981. So if you look at the events of the year, the global market is looking at your conduct. And they're not just looking at your economic indicators. They're looking at your social indicators. They're looking at your political indicators as well. Now, you remember when they shut down the Internet and the, the world was looking at that. The, the repressive response to the protests in, in early Jan said to the world, you can actually take these guys at their word because they said to us that this is now a new dispensation, new era, new regime. And then they're using old regime tactics. And money doesn't like to follow, you know, chaos. It doesn't like to follow disturbance. Anybody's money. You're not going to invest in a situation where people say one thing in January and another thing in June. Remember what they said about the currency. They said that there would be no currency changes. That's what the market took as a strong indicator. In fact, they would come onto a variety of TV platforms saying, we're not going to reintroduce the Zimbabwean dollar. We're not going to mess around with the multi-currency mix. And then in the middle of the year, they say, hang on, now we're actually going to mess around with the currency mix. Forget what we said. Now we're reintroducing this currency. And what's happening now is people are finding out that their US dollar bank accounts, they no longer can access them at short notice. They have to wait for 30 days. And what really is happening is that the government is taking those US dollars and using them to try to resuscitate the economy. So people have lost their real US dollars. They're being given this uh, money which is losing value at a rapid rate. At the beginning of the year, the government was saying that the, the Zim currency is one is to one with the US dollar. Now it's going at one is to 25 on the black market. You know, butter is actually costing well over 250 rand. Loaves of bread are expensive. You're paying over 30 rands for one loaf of bread if you can find it. The fuel price and the energy price are now being pegged to the US dollar. So the reality is the prices haven't changed, but because everything now is in US dollar, the value stays the same, but your currency has depreciated. The inflation now, some people are saying it's as high as 900%. When the government suspended the inflation measuring, which is always a red flag, we were at 175%. And they're willing to concede that maybe it's 300% inflation. That means that the value of the money everyone is earning, you know, has gone down dramatically. The doctors are on strike. So when these guys say to the world, give us more time, what more time do they want? What do they want to do? And the one opportunity that they do have is to actually get real dialogue and real political reforms on the table so that the global community can look again at the investment question and say, maybe we can do that. But because people love power, they don't necessarily want to do that because it's going to mean that ZANU-PF is going to let go of some of the power that they're holding on to now.
So let's get real with this thing. Um, everything that you say is absolutely spot on. But are we really expecting, because uh, for some reason we now want to pretend like Emerson Mnangagwa and others within this new administration were not part of the cabal that actually broke the Zimbabwean economy. But uh, let's get real for a moment and say, are the same people who broke it, are they going to be the ones to fix it? To keep it 100, they cannot fix it, right? You're absolutely right. We have to keep it very, very honest, brutally honest, right? Emerson Mnangagwa has been Mugabe's day one guy. All of the criticisms that extend to Mugabe extend to him. He was head of the, uh, of the intelligence uh, division, and he was very responsible for the atrocities and also for the economic malaise that Zimbabwe is seeing now. So when we, when we look at this group of people, it's the same characters. There was no new regime in Zimbabwe. There was just a transition from Mugabe to Emerson Nangagwa because the military was uncomfortable with the transition of power to Grace Mugabe and the G40, which is why they orchestrated all of that thing to say Mugabe is now surrounded by bad elements. But when you then look at, do these people actually have any understanding of how to resuscitate a failed economy? They clearly don't. There are some ideas which are available. Zimbabwe right now is trying to resuscitate manufacturing. That is notoriously difficult to do in Africa. It's notoriously difficult to do when you've got a failed economy. One of the last things that they have of value is the quality of education. Now, if you were a strategic uh, government, one of the things that you would try to do is to modernize your education system, fix all of the holes that are currently there, but also make Zimbabwe an education destination for surrounding countries which have got education problems because the education in Zimbabwe, the private school education is still relatively cheap. That's a source of revenue for you right there. People trust your education. Why not spruce up some institutions, open up those institutions to international students, have people saying, I can't afford St. John's, I can't afford uh, Rodin, but there's got some excellent schools in Zimbabwe with uh, strict discipline. I'm going to send my kid there and they'll come for the holiday. That could have been a cash incentive uh, and a cash uh, mm. driver. I'm just talking like this is just an idea from an, a, an analyst who's here on TV. How are they failing to get young creative people into the rooms where these discussions need to be had so that they can revitalize their value proposition to the investment community? Investors look at return on investment. If I give you 10 rands, how does that make me 10x return in the short, shortest period of time? That's what they look at. So if Zimbabwe wants to go back to the world and do an IPO, so to speak, to say, listen, we're back. This is what we want. It's not enough just to say we're back. You've got to give people assurances that the reforms are real. You've got to give them assurances that there's some creative space to make money. Mining, to resuscitate mining if it's failed, it takes up to 10 years to rebuild mines, to rebuild that infrastructure. And people just aren't willing to wait that long, especially when you have leadership, mm. which is in question like this. But what changes has Zimbabwe seen since Emerson Mnangagwa became president? Well, there have been some attempts, and these attempts have been things like command agriculture, which has been this uh, inexact application of a Chinese model. You know, the Chinese model, which even the EFF does love here, is that you create economic zones, the government bets on specific winners, and then you channel all of your resources to that specific winner so that the winner can then make you money downstream. So there was an attempt at that, and one of the big ones was command agriculture. But the money that they've been channeling towards agriculture has run out. Unfortunately, we had the hurricane and we also, uh, sorry, Cyclone Idai, and we also have this El Nino weather pattern, which does create instability in agriculture. Anytime you bet on agriculture, you have to face the weather, which you're not always going to be in control of. And Zimbabwe hasn't been able to manage their um, ecological uh, patterns so as to create, you know, uh, surpluses when there's going to be challenges. So right now, in places like Buhera, people are facing real hunger. In places in the rural area where people don't have ready access to supermarkets, etc. But this hunger. against a backdrop of a Zimbabwean government that have recalled uh, farmers uh, to cry and revive that uh, agricultural sector, has that yielded any fruit? Not really, not really. But we must be very candid. You can't resuscitate an economy on agriculture alone. You have to actually uh, diversify the strategy 
beyond agriculture. This was also part of the critique is that you are trying to do 1980 economics in 2019. The world has moved on. And also food security in SADC is not that big of an issue for many of the countries because, you know, Zambia is stable, South Africa is stable. So who exactly are you going to be exporting this food to in the volume that you require to resuscitate your economy? Because most of the African economies are agrarian to a certain extent. So you need to move beyond that as a base. We need to move beyond an economic thinking which just says, look, we're going to plant some crops and we're going to mine some minerals and then everything is going to be all right. That's not what the global economy is looking at right now. And the value chains for that in terms of the benefits to Africa are very low. What we need to be looking at is how do we use our human resource potential to actually get into the game properly. And that requires creative strategy. But how do you do that when you have intensified power outages? You can't. You can't do that when, when you've got the power crisis as it is, where you've got 18 hours. With, and this is the other thing around the mining sector rebooting. You can't reboot it whilst you, you don't have power. You can't get the power whilst you owe a lot of money to power suppliers. You can't get new money unless you do political reforms. Because why am I giving you billions of rands and billions of US dollars if I don't even know where that money is going to go, if I'm seeing people getting rich personally and that money isn't trickling into the economy, you know? China's also not interested right now in giving Zimbabwe money because they've given them tons of money and they haven't seen that return on investment. At the end of the day, your investment story is built on credibility, it's built on transparency, it's built on trust. If you compromise those things, you can't resuscitate the economy. And that's what this regime has failed to understand. I actually think that we're at a point now where we need to start looking at having early elections in Zimbabwe because this particular thing has flopped. And those early elections have to include the diaspora vote. Most countries allow a diaspora to vote. I think that when we looked the other way, and said that Zimbabwe was okay to not allow the diaspora to vote. We actually uh, allowed ZANU PF to, even before the rigging, to control the outcome in a way that was not going to benefit the country. Oh, thank you so much. That was political analyst Jamie Mighty uh, discussing the challenges facing the government of Zimbabwe uh, that have been persistent for a very long time now. Let's take a break.